Well, hi everyone, my name is Eva Matthews Lark. I'm the program manager of Hog Island Audubon Camp in Maine. Welcome to our Making Bird Connections lecture series. For the past seven weeks, we've brought special guests from across the birding network for these free presentations where we connect birding topics to National Audubon Society policies and programs. But we need you to help us make more programs like this possible. Please consider a donation to the Hog Island Audubon Camp today. The link will be down in the chat or comment section. If you've enjoyed these programs, no amount is too small and it will really go a long way to helping us. Also consider checking out our other programs at hogisland.audubon.org. For our final lecture in the series, I'm proud to present my colleague, Dr. Don Lyons, to speak about tracking seabirds. Don is the Director of Conservation Science at National Audubon Society Seabird Institute. His interests include restoring seabird colonies, using social attraction, and understanding relationships between seabirds and forage fish. Don is also a Hog Island Audubon Camp instructor and guest speaker. Don recently was part of our new Puffin Islands online program, which we will be relaunching with new expanded lectures in the next few weeks. So I invite you to check out that on our website, We'll have it updated here soon, and you can take that online course at your own pace. Thanks, Don, so much for joining us tonight. We're proud to have you to be the conclusion of our 2020 Making Bird Connection series. Well, thank you, Eva. Uh, it, it is an honor to wrap up this series. I've, I've seen several of the presentations, and it's kind of a tough act to follow, but uh, I, We'll do our best tonight. Um, and I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. And with luck, you'll, you're all looking at uh, a nice photo of a greater crested tern um, with a miniature transmitting tag uh, attached to its lower back. Um, and it's also carrying a nice fish. This, this bird is on its way back to a breeding colony in China uh, where it's feeding its chick. Um, and this was, uh, this was the year 2018, I guess, um, a couple of years ago now. Um, but uh, a wonderful photo and a great, a great entry into our topic tonight. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to share uh, some recent findings about seabirds and in particular, uh, the, the uh, amazing things we're learning uh, by tracking seabirds using some of this miniaturized electronic uh, gadgetry. Um, and I will go ahead and jump in. Um, there we go. Uh, much of what we know about seabirds uh, historically has been learned by studying seabirds at colonies. Um, this, these two photos show king penguins um, at Bird Island, South Georgia in the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Um, this is a huge and very famous colony of uh, king penguins. Uh, it's a, a regular stop uh, for the tour boats that make it to this part of the world. Um, and a, a really productive place to learn a lot about penguins. You certainly are not hurting for the number of uh, individuals you'd have to study at a colony like this. And you can really learn a lot about their breeding biology, their family practices. Um, for example, how many eggs do they lay? Um, how long do they incubate those eggs? How long does it take to raise a, a penguin chick? Uh, those are all questions that we've learned a lot about uh, by going to some of these uh, remote or often remote uh, colonies, spending time observing birds in great detail. Um, but it turns out that seabirds only spend a portion of their time at a colony. Uh, it's only a small fraction, actually a minority of their year is spent at their colony nesting. The majority of their time is spent away uh, much of the year. Um, and even uh, while they're nesting, a lot of their time is out away from the colony catching uh, the fish of the day. Uh, so with tracking technology, 
we've been able to look at uh, what birds do when they're not sitting at a colony in front of us uh, and really learn some new and amazing things. Um, that's what I'm, I'm interested in sharing today. Uh, this, uh, this bird is a Laysan albatross, a pretty famous one, actually. Um, most folks probably can guess this is wisdom. Um, the oldest known wild bird. Um, she's at least 69 years old. Um, there's a little uncertainty because she wasn't banded until she came back to Midway Atoll, where she nests um, as an adult. And she was somewhere between five and 10 years old when she came back to begin nesting. Uh, we don't know exactly how old she was. So um, she's at least 69, but she could be well into her 70s. Um, and she's still a very uh, productive lady, uh, raising chicks pretty regularly, uh, not this past year, but um, we're hoping that uh, she'll, she'll arrive soon uh, to Midway uh, this fall and, and get started nesting for, I don't know, the umpteenth time now. Um, but I, I wanted to share a picture of her because she's a great example of uh, some of the things we know about seabirds from studying them at colonies. Um, for example, they're very long lived um, for their size, especially. Albatross are pretty big birds, so they're uh, among the most or the very longest lived birds, um, with wisdom being kind of the, the flagship lady of that. Um, they typically don't raise a lot of young in each year, they kind of prefer to invest a lot in individual young. And um, so uh, they live long, they raise lots of young over their lifetime, but it, it takes a long life. And that general life history, we like to call it, or, or that, that lifestyle is pretty true across most seabirds, even the smaller species that may not live as long or uh, certainly don't, uh, may live 15, 20 years. Um, they still usually only have two, maybe three eggs, um, or a lot of them just have one egg. Um, but that life history is a unique um, uh, aspect of seabird life, uh, of seabird biology. Um, and when we lose a, a bird that we've studied for a long time, typically that happens away from the colony, and we never see what led to their ultimate demise. Um, but with tracking, uh, we're beginning to learn some of those those mortality causes and learn what we can do um, to help counter some of those those challenges. Uh, of course, seabirds get their food out of the ocean, uh, such as this cormorant uh, catching fish um, near Baja, Mexico, um, and. Uh, so they explore other environments other than the terrestrial island environment where we see them. Um, and that's both in the water, um, like this cormorant diving, um, and in the air, like this magnificent frigate bird, um, which is truly an amazing aerialist. Um, and because of tracking, we now know that these birds often spend months on the wing without ever landing on land or on the water surface. Um, frigate birds actually are not very waterproof. And if they end up in the water, they get water logged and have a hard time getting back airborne. Um, it, it can be the death of them actually to get incredibly soaked. Um, but they have this amazing ability to shut down portions of their brain and continue flying and sustain flight for months um, when they're not breeding. Um, and so that's something we've only been able to document with tracking technology um, that follows them throughout their non-breeding period. That tracking technology is making leaps and bounds. It, it's really hard to keep up with <laughs> the latest and greatest tags. Um, I, I've shown in this collage uh, tagging uh, efforts on a variety of marine animals, marine wildlife, uh, all the way from uh, seabirds. Um, over on the right, we have a greater crested tern um, that's been tagged and a common myrrh uh, in the lower right. Um, and then an albatross, certainly in the uh, 
upper right there, uh, but also marine mammals, turtles, uh, even whales are getting tagged regularly now. Um, that looks like a bit of an adventure to tag one of those. Uh, someday, maybe I'll get that chance, but uh, right now I'm, I'm sticking to birds. But these tags are benefiting from some of the technological advances that we see all around us. You guys are all watching me uh, on or watching this presentation on a laptop, perhaps, or a phone or a tablet. Um, all of the technology that's packed into your phone, for example, uh, is a huge benefit to tags. Um, and we'll see some of those some of those technologies in the next few slides. Um, but that miniaturization. And uh, the power efficiency, so that we can do so much more with electronics with such limited or small batteries, um, has really allowed us to expand tagging into smaller and smaller organism species. Uh, and so, seabirds were uh, very much a cutting edge uh, among bird tagging because many seabirds, penguins, and albatross in particular, are pretty large and so can carry a pretty hefty tag as bird tags go. Um, but even some of the smaller species now, some of the smaller terns um, or puffins are able to carry tags and allow us to track them and understand where they are and what they're doing um, when not at a colony where we can watch them directly. So some of these technologies that are getting used for uh, seabird tracking are, are really quite sophisticated. Um, I, I've got uh, images here of three technologies. I'll just walk you through to give you a flavor of um, how those are developing. On the left there um, is the Argos technology that relies on what we call the Doppler effect. I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, the uh, change in pitch of a train whistle as a train is approaching you and passing you and departing. Um, and you can use that same effect, which is really just a compression of the wavelength of a sound wave um, for in the case of a train whistle or a radio wave in the case of a tracking tag. Um, and uh, with uh, Argos tags or with these Doppler effect tags, the tag is not moving very much. Um, it might be on a moving bird, but that bird's not moving that fast. The satellite above is actually what's moving very rapidly, causing a compression and then an expansion of the wavelength uh, of that radio wave. Um, and with that information, you can locate the tag uh, with reasonably good precision, um, often to uh, within a kilometer or so, sometimes even better, a few hundred meters. Um, and these these tags are uh, very reliable, can be made quite small, so a, a really great step forward in terms of our ability to track birds. The middle image there, of course, is the GPS uh, constellation of satellites uh, that we're probably all most familiar with. Um, and those allow the location of a transmitting device um, down to uh, tens of meters or potentially even better, uh, depending on uh, how, how stable the, the position of the tag is and, and a few other factors. But really good resolution, um, takes a little more power um, and um, uh, a little more size. Uh, to get that signal. So there are some trade-offs. Um, and then there's quite a few new technologies coming online. Um, I'll just touch on one. It's the Iridium satellite network. It works pretty similarly to the GPS satellite network. Uh, uses different satellites, um, a lot more satellites actually. Um, and you can get locations faster and more frequently uh, using this technology but it's also a bit higher power and larger. Um, so right now, this is only appropriate for some of the larger species that we work with. Um, but this technology is really evolving rapidly. There's a number of uh, companies around the world that are manufacturing bird tags now. Uh, and 
uh, it, it's really a challenge to keep up with what the latest and greatest options are um, for tagging birds. Um, and, and this this figure kind of goes into a little bit about the options. Um, the horizontal scale on this figure represents the mass of a given bird in grams, and you can see that that mass ranges from thousands of grams or or uh, uh, several kilograms. Uh, down to just a few grams, and that that represents the range between something like a large swan, uh, which is uh, several kilograms, um, down to a hummingbird, which might be just a few grams. Um, so uh, an amazing uh, uh, range uh, of bird mass, and there's a variety of tags that will apply um, depending on the given size of bird, um, starting with uh, large GPS tags that transmit to the cellular network, transmit their locations, um, all the way down to uh, geologers, which are a tag that measures light levels and records when sunrise and sunset happens each day. And with that information, you can generate a reasonably accurate location um, uh, anywhere in the world um, usually within a few tens of thousands of kilometers. Um, sorry, uh, within a few tens of kilometers. Um, and when you have no idea where your small little seabird is going, that is new and exciting information to get. Um, so uh, with the rest of my talk, I'm gonna dive into a few vignettes, if you will, or a few stories of tracking. Um, particular species uh, to kind of show off what we're learning using these technologies. Um, and some of these species will be ones that I've worked on personally. Others are uh, species that I uh, really love or just work, amazing tagging work that I really admire. I, and I'll start with Aleutian terns. Um, that's a small tern uh, that nests um, in uh, the far north of the Pacific Basin. Um, this map shows uh, the known colonies. Um, they stretch across Alaska and the Russian Far East um, in a lot of uh, uh, places that are pretty cold and snowy right now. Uh, but uh, when the Aleutian Terns are there during the summer, they're not quite so cold, but, but still a bit chilly. Um, and this is a really poorly known species. It, it nests in these uh, remote areas where there are not very many people and even fewer biologists um, looking around at the seabirds there. Um, and so there's very little known about them. And even as recently as 10 or 15 years ago, it was unknown where these birds migrated um, when they were not nesting. Um, they were known in these areas during the summer, but no one knew where they were the rest of the year. It wasn't clear kind of how much uh, they might travel. So uh, I got involved with partners uh, doing some tracking in Alaska. And initially, we looked at movements during the breeding season, during the summer, while birds were there. And this track is of an individual that was tagged on Kodiak Island, this large island in the western Gulf of Alaska. Um, this map shows uh, the south, the southern coast of Alaska. Um, bordering the Gulf of Alaska. So there's Prince William Sound and Cook Inlet leading up to Anchorage. Um, and this bird really traveled quite far during the breeding season, multiple hundreds of kilometers, um, crossed the Gulf of Atlantic to some other breeding, breeding areas for this species, such as Prince William Sound and even Yakutat Bay uh, to the east there. Um, and we were pretty impressed. Um, we did not know if individuals would travel this much, um, especially during the breeding season. Um, so it seemed like this bird got around and kind of knew where other nesting colonies were. But what we were really impressed by was the migration that we saw this, uh, this species do. And here's a track showing where it goes after nesting. So it starts up here. Um, this is the southern edge of the Alaska Peninsula and the Aleutian Island chain here. So the southern end of Alaska. Um, and this bird crossed the North Pacific. 
um, went through this strait between the two large northern islands of Japan, um, worked its way down the Korean coast and part of the coast of China before veering off uh, around Taiwan, heading south into the Philippines, and eventually heading back east a little bit and spending the winter in Papua New Guinea. Um, so really an amazing migration, a very unusual one to go from North America to Southeast Asia. Um, there's only a handful of species that, that navigate this flyway um, all the way from Alaska, from any part of North America, um, down to Southeast Asia. It seems like a, a really nice place to spend the winter. Um, people did not know there were Aleutian terns there. It turns out the winter plumage of this species looks incredibly similar to the winter plumage of common terns. And there are many more common terns um, in Asia that, that winter in Southeast Asia. And until about 20 years ago, all of the guidebooks uh, did not even mention Aleutian terns. No one was there identifying them. Uh, and so it wasn't, it wasn't known that's where they were. But tracking, uh, tracking them was able to show us that. And now they're regularly spotted in places like Jakarta Bay, um, and along migration in Hong Kong and other places. So um, a, a really neat discovery about this bird um, that we obtained by some careful tracking. Another track from a, a different individual, um, and I, I just threw this one up here as a bonus, um, but wanted to mention that it, it uh, moved into Southeast Asia, uh, moved along the coast of Vietnam and actually crossed the Malaysian Peninsula into the Indian Ocean Basin. So it went from North America all the way into the Indian Ocean, which is really an amazing migration. Um, really uh, impressive birds uh, doing something really unique and, and fascinating. Another species of tern uh, that I've worked with uh, is the Caspian tern. This is the largest species of tern in the world. Um, and I studied them in, in the Western US, Western North America. Um, and we looked at migration in this species and, and we did that by tagging some individuals in Eastern Washington state. Uh, Caspian terns nest both on the coast and on inland wetlands. Um, we were working at an inland wetland that had the opportunity to tag some individuals and look at migration and saw that they display four main uh, migratory pathways, um, and these are defined by the mountain ranges um, along the way, uh, such as the Cascade Mountain Range and the Sierra Nevada. Um, and they tend not to want to uh, do all the work to fly over those mountains, so they follow those ranges uh, southward. Um, and you can see that all four of these migration routes converge on a stopover site in Southern California. Um, and that was a, a huge percentage of birds stopped there for weeks, even a month or two. Um, and that site uh, was the Salton Sea, a really unusual water body. Um, it, it exists in the Salton Basin, which is a closed basin, um, and a basin that across geologic time has been filled with uh, lakes of various sizes. Um, but also has experienced periods where it was completely dry. And in the several hundred years before the 20th century, it was completely dry. But in the early 1900s, uh, people wanting to farm uh, decided to irrigate some of their potential farmland, diverted, uh, worked on diverting the Colorado River um, to provide that uh, flood water for irrigation. Um, but accidentally diverted the entire river for well over a year into this basin and formed a very large lake. <laughs> um, after uh, about 18 months or so, uh, the river resumed uh, its former channel and continued on to Mexico and the Gulf of California. Um, but we were left with a huge freshwater lake um, that was a uh, wonderful habitat for fish um, and thus uh, fish eating birds. And so uh, species like Caspian terns and American white pelicans 
double crested cormorants, uh, grebes, and, and a, a large number of other species um, have made good use of the Salton Sea for over 100 years. Uh, but in the last few years, um, because this is a closed basin and re receives very little natural water, um, it is gradually, uh, because it's very warm there, evaporated off much of the water, leaving the remaining water saltier and saltier, um, and leaving uh, the lake bed here drier and drier. Um, and that photo in the upper right um, represents a couple hills, which were formerly islands, which formerly hosted a very large double-crested cormorant colony, um, nesting alongside some other species. Uh, the Salton Sea is no longer good fish habitat. It's so salty that even the most salt tolerant of species, um, a strain of tilapia, uh, can no longer survive in the lake. Uh, so we're seeing fish eating birds abandon this site um, and we're hopeful they can find alternatives. Um, but right now the, the verdict is out. Um, that, that uh, in my view, calls for another tracking study. Um, with Caspian terns, we had this large tagged population, so we were also able to look at how they or where they spent the winter. And in this flyway, this many birds spent their winter along the west coast of Mexico or even at inland reservoirs. Um, these uh, uh, colored areas in the lower right of this map are areas where there's large reservoirs. Um, and so you can see this individual was quite widespread over the winter, um, covering you know, several hundred, maybe even a thousand kilometers um, across its entire range. But uh, there was a lot of variability from one individual to the next. This next individual found a place much to its liking. Um, and you can see by that scale, um, actually traveled less than 25 kilometers all winter. It spent uh, its entire winter in that lagoon, uh, in that single lagoon, um, finding what it was looking for there, apparently a pretty robust fish population. So we're, we're learning things about the winter habitat of seabird species and their allied species like these Caspian terns. Um, we're also learning some things about what they're doing during the breeding season. As we saw a little bit with the Lucian terns, these Caspian terns are really a champion of exploring their colony network. Caspian terns uh, can uh, prospect for uh, new colonies. Um, they move between colonies frequently. Um, and they can prospect both before the breeding season and after the breeding season. And we looked at a network of 21 known colonies uh, numbered on that map on the left of this slide um, and looked at how many turns visited each colony and uh, connected colonies by visiting multiple colonies. And you can see that this network of colonies is really well traveled by this group of birds. Um, they have really excellent knowledge of where colonies are and can go check out conditions at several of them and decide where the best place for them to nest is in any given year. So we tend to often think about protecting one colony or, or maybe two or three colonies for a given species. Um, we really need to be thinking at much larger scales. Um, these, these colony networks for some of these a very vagile species are uh, on really immense scales and really challenge us as conservationists to think at the scale they do. Uh, so uh, again, another uh, amazing result of tracking that, that we didn't appreciate uh, until we were able to see the movements these birds make. And when we're talking about turns and movements, uh, we cannot uh, omit the amazing Arctic tern. Probably many of you are aware that uh, the Arctic tern is heralded as the longest distance migrant of any vertebrate species in the world. Um, from their uh, breeding region, which is high, high latitude in the northern hemisphere, um, 
along the uh, east coast of North America, that's um, in the waters off the state of Maine, all the way up to Greenland. Um, and uh, so they, they breed uh, in those high latitudes during the summer, high northern latitudes, um, where they experience really long days, of course. Um, and then they travel uh, during the fall, our fall, um, all the way south um, to uh, these uh, very high latitudes of the southern hemisphere. Essentially, uh, they, they converge on the ice off of Antarctica um, and spend time loafing on the ice and foraging in the waters nearby. Um, so they travel the entire planet north to south um, during the fall and then back south to north again um, during the uh, ensuing spring. And so I like to think of them as the bird of light. They experience really long days during our summer here in the northern hemisphere. And during our winter, they're down in the southern hemisphere experiencing really long days in the austral summer. Um, so they probably experience more daylight in a year than any other species. Okay. But really amazing, this is a bird that weighs around 120 grams. Um, so uh, really small, about, you know, not a, not a whole lot bigger um, than an American robin or not a whole lot smaller than a, a small crow. Um, and they travel the world. Um, and so really amazing flyers, obviously adept at catching fish, their, their prey um, in a lot of different habitats. Um, there's also uh, some interesting aspects of their migration. So that earlier map I showed you was Arctic terns that we tagged, Audubon tagged in Maine um, and their migrations southward. They spent quite a bit of time along the east coast of South America, off Argentina primarily. Uh, well, other people have tracked Arctic terns that nest in Alaska, um, in Prince William Sound actually. Um, and those birds migrate down uh, uh, the western side of the Americas. Amazingly, they cross the Andes um, in uh, Chile and Argentina, uh, and then uh, forage in the waters uh, east of Argentina, along with their uh, cousins <laughs> um, from the uh, Atlantic basin, um, and spend time overlapping with them every winter. Um, we often call this migratory connectivity. So populations that are distinct breeding populations don't overlap at all when they're breeding, um, can overlap uh, during migration. And we imagine that this promotes some mixing, that here and there a bird uh, gets confused and heads up the wrong ocean basin. Okay, I'd like to uh, move away from turns. Uh, you probably have gathered by now that I am a bit of a turn fan. Um, and, and tackle, uh, you know, some stories about other species. And I'll, I'll start with Cormorants, which are another really favorite bird of mine, um, and uh, talk a bit about how we can learn the differences between seemingly very similar species. So on the left is uh, a family of double-crested cormorants, an adult uh, with a tag on its back, um, and on the right is a similar family of branch cormorants, um, and these birds nest together on an island at the mouth of the Columbia River um, between uh, Oregon and Washington states. Um, so they nest together. They're very similar size. They look pretty similar with a few exceptions, um, some coloration on their googler pouch, um, and some of the, the uh, breeding plumage is slightly different, um, but uh, very similar to the casual observation. Um, but it turns out they use habitat differently. Um, and by tracking each uh, individuals of each species, we can see that 
double crested cormorants on the left are are generalists. They will use the river habitat. They'll use the mouth of the river. They'll use some of the ocean environment or bays north or south of this river mouth. Whereas branch cormorants on the right are pretty tied to that mouth of the river. They just forage in that uh, pretty deep water um, and very brackish or marine water. So um, tracking helps us understand how these uh, two species are subtly different. Um, we also tracked these birds with tags that had pressure sensors. So we could see how deep in the water they were diving. And we could see that um, in the left figure, um, when they dove in similar uh, depths uh, in, in areas that were uh, uh, the same, uh, that had the same depth, water depth, uh, branch cormorants here in blue uh, typically dove deeper. Um, and then uh, on the right, uh, that diagram uh, suggests that um, branch cormorants in blue also selected areas that were just deeper in general um, and dove all the way to the bottom in those deeper areas. So kind of consistent with their different use of space in two dimensions on, that, on those maps on the previous slide, uh, in the third dimension, they also use habitat differently. Even though uh, they appear very similar, um, they're doing quite different things. And it, it's only been tracking that's, that's really illuminated those differences in recent years. Um, and then a, a fun outgrowth of this work on cormorants um, has been uh, a contribution to data sets that oceanographers can really use. And the, the most straightforward example that I like uh, of this is using all of the dives that these cormorants performed around the mouth of Columbia and knowing how deep they dove, um, constructing a bathymetric map, uh, basically a map of the channels of this river mouth. Um, and that's put together on the right. Uh, with shallow areas in green and deeper areas in red. And this actually is very similar. Um, it is a very good reproduction of um, uh, bathymetric maps that have been produced by a ship going over this water with a sonar system and uh, measuring depth that way. So cormorants are actually quite good oceanographers. They can be very helpful to us. Um, and. Uh, help us um, understand uh, bits about the ocean environment that, that are hard to get data on otherwise. Um, another example of uh, seabirds telling us some useful things uh, is presented by uh, these albatross, and this is a fairly recent study, um, just came out this year, um, but these albatross were tagged, these are wandering albatross, and they were tagged with a, a tag that could detect radar. Um, and so when they're close to uh, ships, um, they detect that radar signal and um, can identify that there's a ship in the area. Um, they, these, these tags actually transmit the data to a satellite. Um, and that's really useful because not all ships out there are uh, uh, doing the right thing. There is a fair number of people out there fishing um, and not telling anyone they're fishing, this Ill illegal harvest is a, a big problem uh, in terms of managing fisheries so that we have sustainable fish populations. Um, and these albatross were able to tell us where, uh, where they encountered uh, vessels. Albatross do tend to like to follow fishing vessels. They often get scraps or steel bait off of some of the fishing gear. And you can see, all of these pin drops on this map are places where a tagged albatross encountered a vessel of some type. And that alone doesn't mean that there's a lot of illegal fishing going on. Um, but uh, legitimate vessels have a transmitter and are communicating where their location is at all times. Um, and so that database is generally not widely available because fishermen like to keep their hot fishing spots secret. 
um, but it is collected. Um, and you can compare where albatross encountered vessels with where we knew people were fishing and find out where there are people out there in boats, most often fishing, um, but they aren't telling anyone about it. Um, and so there's now a, a proposal to use these albatross as detectives to help us know when and where illegal fishing is happening. So pretty neat. Um, the last bit of tracking technology I wanna leave you with is of course, one of our favorites at Project Puffin. Um, and that's uh, looking at the wintering distribution of Atlantic puffins from Maine. Um, and the map at the right is showing you an animation of a tracked puffin. Um, these red red lines that are uh, getting displayed currently are the first year of two years of tracking for this individual. Um, and uh, we're now in the summer period. And there it goes again in the fall. That blue color is the second year of this tracking. Um, and you can see that it wanders uh, the North Atlantic. Um, but I want to draw your attention to um, these two yellow polygons here that, that um, this bird moved through in consecutive years. It happens that that is a national marine monument, um, the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts National Marine Monument, the first national marine monument set aside in the Atlantic um, by the United States. Um, and an important area uh, for puffins and many other uh, types of marine wildlife. Um, and for puffins, it's an important area for them to get food during the deepest, darkest part of the winter. Um, so uh, I think Charlotte is gonna cover a bit more on that. Um, I will leave it there. Um, and hand it back to Eva um, to continue our presentation. Thanks, Don. Our Bird Connection speaker tonight is Charlotte Runzel. Charlotte is a policy analyst at National Audubon Society. Her focus is on marine conservation and Gulf of Mexico restoration. Her work advances innovative conservation solutions through policy, research, and management. Thanks, Charlotte, for being here tonight to expand on the work that National Audubon Society is doing and to discuss the marine protected areas. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen and get started. Um, all right, I think we should be good to go. Um, hi, everyone. Oh, I think that's in your presenter mode. Oops. Um, okay. Sorry, I have too many things open. <laughs> okay, let's see if this is going to work. And there's Lots of questions out there about marine protected areas, so you're in luck because Charlotte is going to be talking on that subject here in just a few minutes. Okay, is this better? Perfect, that looks great. Sorry. Um, Okay, hi everyone. Yeah, so I, I work at National. I do a lot of different policy work, um, so I engage with Capitol Hill and agencies. Um, I would like to say that I mostly do seabird policy work. Um, so one of my main issue areas is marine protected areas. Um, and I, I focus on this and obviously Audubon focuses on seabird protection because um, seabirds are, are really at risk. Um, so since the 1950s, uh, seabird populations globally have declined by 70%. Um, and that is with incre the increasing amount of human disturbances to our oceans and coasts. Um, so that includes things like overfishing of seabird prey, um, entanglement in fishing gear, 
climate change, habitat destruction, and more. Um, and Don talked about this a little bit, um, but seabirds need forage fish for food. Um, and they also need undisturbed habitat to be able to nest and thrive and um, survive. Um, so this is where MPAs come in or marine protected areas come into um, you know, their, their life history and survival, um, they uh, provide areas of um, areas strictly limited from human disturbances. Um, so that generally includes mining, drilling, fishing, boat traffic, and many more. Um, and a lot of these things can directly threaten seabirds and other marine wildlife and the resources that seabirds um, rely on. Um, so on the next slide, I'll actually give a couple of examples of different marine protected areas and um, all over the country and in the ocean, they really differ um, on management styles. Um, so here we are. So this is um, a map of all of the different marine protected areas all over the country. Um, and I have listed the different types of marine protected areas. Um, and each one is really managed by different entities. So we have the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We have the Department of the Interior and Fish and Wildlife. Um, so um, sanctuaries are, are nominated and go through a public process while monuments are designated by, by the president. So I saw in the chat that someone asked um, if Obama designated the um, Canyons and Seamounts National Marine Monument, and he did. Um, there are also um, reserves focused on science and research and wildlife refuges that are more focused on conservation and management. Um, ocean parks are via the national park system. They provide recreational use areas while working to conserve those areas. Um, and I'm gonna go through a couple examples of different sanctuaries and monuments um, and what how, how they manage those areas. So the Mallows Bay um, Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary is a historical site um, and their management plan prohibits damaging sanctuary resources, but allows fishing military activities. Um, and then there's the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary which prohibits oil and gas exploration and, and extraction, drilling, discharging, taking marine mammals, sea turtles, and birds, operating watercraft except in specific zones, but allows recreational fishing. And then we have Papahānau Mokuakea um, in Hawaii or off the coast of Hawaii, which Obama um, also designated. And that prohibits oil and gas exploration, discharge, removing monument resources, drilling, anchoring on coral, commercial fishing, and more. Um, so all of these, you know, extractive or damaging activities are really decided by um, the public process. And then if it's a presidential um, action, it's decided by the White House. Um, and I got into this a little bit, but MPAs have a huge ecological importance. Um, so depending on their protections, um, they can provide critical and undisturbed habitat. So I know Don mentioned that the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Monument was really important for puffins. Um, and it's also important for whales, fish, and some other marine wildlife. Um, and it, not only do they provide these undisturbed areas for marine wildlife to, you know, exist as they naturally would, um, a lot of the protections also have spillover impacts for prey. So um, if you're not fishing in an area, the fish in that specific area, the population gets so healthy that, uh, that it'll start spilling over into other areas in the ocean. Um, and that um, benefit seabirds that are not existing in that area as well, um, as well as other marine organisms. Um, and then lastly, if it's a coastal marine protected area, um, that can also protect coastal habitat. So 
um, things like wetlands um, and marshland that that bird that are really important for birds um, also act as carbon sinks. So in a way, these marine protected areas could also mitigate harm from climate change um, by absorbing carbon dioxide out of the air into the roots of, of those ecosystems. Um, and then that also provides really great habitat for shorebirds. Um, and we've mentioned this monument a couple times, and I think well, Audubon really likes to focus on it because we did so much good science to show where puffins were existing and, and how they use the monument. Um, so I'm gonna go into a little bit of the history. And then I also know that someone commented about this monument saying that, you know, didn't Trump roll this back? So there have been a couple of different um, actions. So I'll go through that in the next slide. Um, so it was established by Obama in 2016 and it's the first major national monument in the Atlantic. Um, it contains really rare deep sea corals that um, provide shelter and food and spawning habitat for fish and invertebrates. Um, and this was uh, so really well supported. Um, I think even before Obama designated it, over 200 marine scientists, educators, business owners, surfers, members of faith-based organizations, and various um, aquariums and conservation organizations supported this um, this designation. And then also 300,000 people from around the country sent messages to President Obama in support of this. Um, so um, Obama followed through on the action and designated the monument via a proclamation in September of 2016. Um, and so the, this uh, monument has been subject to a lot of different um, legal battles and then most recently um, Trump rolling back commercial fishing protections. So this slide kind of lays out a timeline um, ever after the, the monument was designated in 2016. In 2015, um, fishing groups filed a lawsuit seeking to abolish the monument and open it up to commercial fishing. Um, and to protect the monument and the marine ecosystem, environmental groups intervened in the lit litigation and filed a brief supporting the federal government's motion to dismiss the group's complaint, explaining that the monument was lawfully created and um, Audubon was actually involved in this suit as well. Um, we submit an amicus brief, so basically just uh, support for the, the lawsuit, um, or sorry, support for the intervening suit. Um, and we explain the positive impacts to birds um, in that amicus brief. Um, and in 2018, the district court issued a decision upholding the legality of the monument and dismissed the complaint. Um, and then again, the fishing industry groups appealed the decision to the DC Circuit Court of Appeals. And on December 27, 2019, the DC Circuit rejected the group's challenge, affirmed that the district court and once again upheld the president's authority under the Antiquities Act, which is how presidents can um, designate the, these areas to protect the ecosystem. And those were a lot of wins um, legitimizing the proclamation that Obama made. Um, and again, in June 2020, fishing groups filed a petition asking the U.S. Supreme Court to review this D the D.C. Circuit's decision. So every time that um, a suit was overturned, the fishing groups came back and tried to um, kind of do anything they could to get this monument removed. Um, and at the same time, uh, President Trump signed a proclam proclamation to strip the monument of its core protection and reopen it to commercial fishing. Um, so once this happened, environmental groups filed a new lawsuit called Conservation Law Foundation versus Trump and challenged the proclamation. Um, and it's really interesting because currently, I think it's it's been known that only 5% of the fishing group's revenue actually comes from this monument. It's pretty off, 
pretty far offshore and really hard to get to. Um, so really by protecting this area, it was, it was protecting from um, future um, technology that can be made that could let boats get far out and, and extract. Um, so it didn't really have that much of an effect on what the commercial fishing groups were actually taking out of the water at the time. Um, and, you know, Biden could have a role in, um, in the next administration overturning President Trump's proclamation. Um, so we will see what happens, but um, hopefully he decides to, to do that. Um, and then the next thing, and, and you all may have heard of this before, is the 30 by 30 campaign for nature. Um, so a lot of environmental groups, um, scientists, faith-based organizations, a lot of groups that have um, supported monuments in the past, excuse me, um, are supporting this. Uh, it's kind of like a big campaign. So it's to protect 30% of U.S. land and 30% of U.S. ocean by 2030. And right now, only 15% of land and 7% of the ocean of the, the U.S. in the U.S. boundaries um, are protected. So this campaign is calling for a network of highly protected uh, marine areas. So um, that's, you know, no oil and gas extraction, no commercial fishing. Um, and no, nothing that can destroy the ecosystem. And there are five pillars to accomplish this. So that includes supporting locally led conservation, working toward a more equitable and inclusive vision for nature conservation, honoring the so sovereignty of tribal nations, supporting private con conservation and being guided by science. And currently this campaign does exist as a federal resolution. So um, as Senate Resolution 372 and House Resolution 835. Um, and we are really encouraged because this campaign has been embraced by uh, President Biden's campaign. Um, and there are rumors that he will sign an executive order on his first day in office um, to, do, to do this, to protect this ocean and land, which is pretty exciting. And, oh, sorry. Lastly, I just wanted to say that um, your voice matters. So a lot of the actions in the U.S. with marine protected areas um, are open for public comment process, processes. And then also with, so, so you have the opportunity to use your voice and write a letter saying that you support a marine sanctuary nomination or ocean park or whatever the action is. Um, and you can also ask if you don't think that the regulations within that area are strong enough, you can also ask for stronger regulations. Um, and then the next thing is uh, with the 30 by 30 campaign, you can contact your representative and tell them that you support the resolution and they should co-sponsor it. Um, and then Third, a lot of the um, actions here, Audubon's advocacy team um, tees up in what we call action alerts. You may already be familiar with that, but it's a way where you can just fill out your information and very quickly send um, a letter that we create. Um, you can edit it in, in the form to, to personalize it, um, but we just make it easy for you to submit that letter to your um, to the agency or to your member of Congress. Um, so I think Ava is going to post that in the chat, um, but that is an easy way to stay updated on what's going on. That is my last slide. Great, thanks so much, uh, Charlotte and, and Don, both of you for sharing your information about seabirds and marine conservation. And thanks to all of you out there joining us tonight. Uh, we're so glad that you're able to be here and to support Hog Island Audubon Camp. I really hope that you consider making a donation if you enjoyed the presentations. I will make sure that that donation link is in the chat comments. But now we're gonna get to some of your questions. 
Uh, there's still plenty of time. So if you have questions for either Don or Charlotte, uh, drop them in the chat box or the comment section on Facebook, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So we're going to start with one uh, from Jody, and this one is for you, Charlotte. And Jody says, are there different levels of management and protection depending on the organization that manages the um, MPA? Um, no, it's really more about the public comment process and the management uh, plan that's in place for the sanctuary or the refuge or the park. Um, it, it's, it's really just dependent on what happens in the public comment process or if it's a monument what the president decides. But it's not really like a one size fits all for each different, um, each different uh, MPA. Great. Uh, our next question, we had a few questions in the chat, uh, Don, about transmitters and how that affects uh, birds. So one of was from Mar, she asked, do tags affect breeding behavior? Um, do other birds notice the tag visually? Do they see it? Does it affect their behavior at all? Right, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, th there are some guidelines or, or practices that we follow to minimize the impact of tags on the bird. Uh, the first one and most important rule of thumb is that we always make sure that the tag is less than 3% of the body mass of the bird. Um, so uh, we definitely want to keep it as light as possible. Uh, and in some cases, we use even lighter tags just to be safe. Um, and so that, that's a big concern. With uh, species that dive underwater, we're also concerned about how tall the tag is, how, how far it sticks out from the body, because that in water can provide a lot of drag, hydrodynamic drag as opposed to aerodynamic drag. Um, and so that can be a real uh, concern as well. So flatter, smaller tags are definitely what we prefer. Um, it, if, it's, if the tag is too large, it can impact the bird's behavior. Um, we uh, generally, if we see that happening, we're quick to recapture the bird and remove the tag. Great, and as a follow-up question to that, we had a question from Dina, she says, how exactly does the transmitter stay on the bird? Yeah, there's a, a variety of techniques used to hold the tag onto a bird. Um, with turns, most of the tagging that I showed in this talk um, was with a what we call a leg loop harness. Um, it, it's a little bit like a climbing harness is on a person, on us, um, and it positions the tag uh, in about the same location on a bird's body as, as like a fanny pack would be on us. Um, so on the lower back. Um, and that harness is made out of um, a soft, flexible ribbon uh, made out of Teflon fiber, actually, um, that degrades over time and it will eventually fall off. It, it will break. Um, it, if it starts to fray, it will break quickly, um, but it breaks and then the tag falls off. Um, there are other ways to attach tags. Um, uh, one common way for short tag durations or when, the, when the, you only need a few days of data is to tape a tag to the feathers on the back of the bird and then recapture the bird, for example, and take it off, um, take it off of those feathers and, and let it go on about its business. We have another question about um, transponders from Kathy. She said she photographed a snow goose last winter with a transponder on it. Is there a website where you could go in and uh, put the, the number so that you could actually track and see where the bird is or where it's been? Yeah, unfortunately, with tracking data, there's not a centralized database or website to report sightings. If you see a bird that has a band on it that you can read, 
um, like a large plastic band with engraved letters or numbers that form a code, um, you can go to the bird banding lab. Uh, it's a USGS uh, uh, laboratory based in Maryland. They have a website. If you just search for bird banding lab, you'll find it. And you can report uh, what that code was, what the species of bird you saw it on, and where you saw it. Um, and that is really great and very valuable information to report. So we're going to switch gears here. This is a question for Charlotte. Um, it comes from Corey. Corey says, uh, they're a lifelong Texan. The beaches of the Gulf Coast, uh, of course, have been impacted by offshore drilling. Is there any conservation efforts that Audubon is involved with uh, in the Gulf? Yeah, there's a ton. Um, I so, so on the topic of marine protected areas, we just um, submit comments for the Flower Garden Banks um, expansion. So it's like an existing sanctuary, and um, Noah was working to expand areas where there are. Um, free from where it's free from drilling and commercial fishing. Um, so I think we're just waiting to hear back what the final um, results of that are. And then um, in terms of conservation, we do a ton of different um, uh, conservation projects in the Gulf related to wetland restoration. Um, there's also a Gulf stewardship program to um, make sure that uh, beach goers are safely using the beach. Um, and then we also advocate for funding from the BP oil spill settlement, or sorry, settlement um, to conserve areas in the Gulf um, for birds and other wildlife. Um, so we're in the, the process of um, submitting some proposals for that across the Gulf and also in places um, where seabirds are actually if they're traveling from the Gulf into other areas such as the Bahamas, um, there's also conservation in place to make sure that the birds impacted by that oil spill are thriving in other areas. Um, if you want to find out more about our Gulf program, um, I will post our website in the chat, uh, but we do a ton of stuff. The Gulf is one of our main um, conservation priority areas. So Charlotte, earlier you shared those um, maps that showed the marine protected areas around the United States. Uh, Dina asks, are there other countries protecting marine environments that we know about? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there are a ton of marine protected areas all over um, internationally, and there's definitely a lot of different degrees of protection. Um, some marine protected areas in other countries are actually community led um, to make sure that communities have enough fish resources to sell and for their families. Um, yeah, there, there are, there's a ton everywhere. Um, I think it's a, an on, a, a concept that people are adopting because it really helps the ecosystem and then also the surrounding ecosystem thrive. So we have some turn questions out there for you, Don. Um, one is from Karen. She says, do you know what the mileage is for the Aleutian turn migration? You showed that great map that goes from Southern Alaska to Papua New Guinea. Um, and, and you also mentioned how, how Arctic turns are the, the longest migrants, but what, how does that compare with Aleutian turn? Right, yeah, uh, Arctic turns are the champ. Uh, going almost pole to pole, um, it, it's hard to beat that. <laughs> um, so, and, you know, there's a lot of variation from one bird to the next, and they, they don't take straight routes, of course. Uh, but in general, uh, kind of the conventional numbers people throw out uh, for Arctic turns is uh, that they'll, they'll travel 10,000 kilometers one way. Um, Aleutian terns probably are traveling six or 7,000 kilometers one way, you know, roughly speaking. Um, I, I have not actually, I'm, I'm uh, guilty, I have not uh, actually calculated the tracks or the distance of the two tracks that I showed you tonight. Um, I, that sounds like some homework for me to go off and do. Um, but uh, yeah, Aleutian terns, even though they're, they're adding some east-west uh, distance, to, to their travel, 
they still don't match the Arctic Tern quite as much. For those out there that need the conversion, that's about 4,350 miles mm -hmm. or so. Um, another question about Aleutian Terns. So uh, now we know how far, how long does it take them to do that route? So that's a question that's coming from Nancy. Just curious, how long is that bird um, migrating? Yeah, they cover all that ground in about a month, actually, um, uh, on the way south. Um, we have less information uh, coming back north, but usually that's faster. That might just be a couple of weeks, 10 days, two weeks to come back to their nesting area. Um, a, a lot of birds tend to travel more quickly in the spring when they're in a hurry to get to a nesting area and um, uh, find find their their space their their particular nest nest territory. Um, but uh, on the way south, it's about a month. Um, it's so they're they're not doing uh, long distance flights. They're they're not flying hundreds of miles in a day nonstop. They definitely stop and forage uh, along the way and and keep fueling up as they go. So we have a question from Facebook from Clayton. He asked, um, we see numbers of Caspian terns in central I Iowa in the spring. Um, mm -hmm. Are these generally juveniles? And do you have any tag birds that you've seen that are going to the central part of the United States? Right. So the population we tagged was all on the West Coast. Um, and we did see a bird cross the continental divide in Montana and spend some time in eastern Montana. Uh, it never actually got into the Dakotas. Um, it was in the Yellowstone River Basin and uh, uh, the Missouri. Um, but uh, so there are rare individuals that will cross these flyways, um, but it, it's a fairly small number in any given generation. Enough to make sure that there's some genetic mixing, uh, but but not enough to see numbers fluctuate um, based on that movement. We have a question from Karen uh, about MODIS towers. How does that factor in with uh, tracking? Yeah, so MODIS towers, that's a great question. Um, MODIS towers are this really useful technique where um, people are starting to converge on buying uh, a couple different types of tags, um, and then there's a network of towers, uh, receiving stations that anyone can put up and collect data on whatever birds might be flying by with this uh, particular type of tag. Um, and those data then are stored and downloaded and shared with a central database um, so that people can, the people who put on the tags on, on given birds um, or uh, it, other people just interested in the migration can uh, search that database and start to look at uh, migration. So um, people probably know there, or many people probably know uh, that there is a MODIS tower on Hog Island. Um, and so uh, we're actively collecting data there all the time for birds that fly by. Um, MODIS towers are unfortunately um, only useful uh, where those towers are located. And so for many seabirds, which are out on the open ocean, um, they wouldn't get picked up by a MODIS tower. Um, so we, with seabirds, we often rely on these tags that can transmit their location to satellites um, as the most efficient way to get a lot of data. Yeah, and for those who want to see the information coming from the MODIS tower on Hog Island, you can go to modis.org. Uh, hit the explore data and zoom into Hog Island, and you can see the the recent download that we have provided. Um, another question is um, for both of you: Is uh, Charlotte, you did a great job of outlining some action items for people joining the Audubon Action Network, which we dropped the link for. Um, getting involved with the the thirty by thirty campaign, but maybe both of you could just uh, leave us here tonight with what what can people at home do that will directly help and, and affect seabirds and marine conservation? Do 
Charlotte, why don't you jump in? Um, yeah, I think getting involved in our campaigns um, is really awesome. We do a ton of different policy work. Um, and a, you can also um, get involved with your local chapter. And a lot of the chapters across the country do stewardship work. So that's directly stewarding um making sure that birds have safe places to nest on beaches, that they're not disturbed by cars or dogs or things like that. Um, and a lot of our chapters across the country are also plugged into those campaigns I mentioned. Um, but I think just stay tuned it, um, on Twitter. We always are pushing out different ways to get engaged um, via action alert and then also signing up for that action alert system um, that, that directs you to um, our email system that will email you about a ton of different different things that are affecting birds, but also seabirds. Um, and I can also post my email in the chat if you're looking to directly contact your representatives um, about some of these things, maybe calling into their office or um, emailing one of their staffers. Let me know. I can give you talking points and um, connect you to the right people. So I'll, I'll post that now. I would just add, you know, Charlotte has great connections, and uh, it, she she and the, some other people on our team host a fly-in where people come to Washington D.C. and directly meet with their representatives. And even this year, when that wasn't possible, um, Charlotte and company arranged a virtual fly-in that connected people with. Um, their representatives and staff online. So um, uh, Audubon has amazing people working to influence policy and help birds. Um, I, I would add just a couple other things that we can all do. Um, it, uh, a couple other threats for seabirds that are global um, are uh, increasing plastic pollution. So anything we can all do to reduce our use of plastic is a good thing. Um, that inevitably ends up in the ocean and uh, poses risks for seabirds. And then the other thing, of course, is uh, anything we can do as far as advocating or uh, reducing our own personal uh, carbon footprint um, to reduce the impacts of climate change um, and mitigate for those. Uh, that that is probably the biggest threat for seabirds over the next century. And whatever we all can do to um, reduce that threat and mitigate for it um, will be really important. And so thinking about that as as much as all of us can um, it is really critical. Thanks for for. Um giving people some ideas of what they can do and make a difference. Um, and and I, if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Charlotte has put her email in the chat box, so you can reach out to her directly. Uh, unfortunately, this is concluding our Making Bird Connections lecture series for 2020. Uh, next, I do want to introduce our new Turn the Page book club. Our book club is available for purchase today. And it would make a wonderful holiday gift for those birding and nature enthusiasts in your life. It includes four books mailed to your home, eight book club meetings, including our Meet the Author Talks. And we hope that you'll join us with this new program that starts in January. Uh, as a special incentive tonight for all my viewers out there, if you sign up tonight or tomorrow and you send me a confirmation uh, that you have purchased the book club, I will send you a a prize, a, a turn the page prize in the mail to you. So you can forward that confirmation to Hog Island at Audubon.org and I'll get that in the mail for you um, and you'll have it soon. We'll be shipping out the first books here in December. I'm very excited about it. Our first book is going to be this Big Birds of Maine book. Uh, you'll see it's huge. It's a comprehensive listing of all the birds uh, in the state hasn't been done in many decades. So this is gonna be a great volume. And certainly we're gonna keep talking about seabirds 
and conservation as we go through our book club as well. So I look forward to seeing all of you in the future. Thank you so much for joining us. And don't forget, um, if you'll give a donation to Hog Island, it really will help us support our program. So that link is uh, available to all of you. And I know so many of you have been coming to every lecture. I am going to be typing up all of the links and notes and putting those on our program webpage. So definitely check back and see those so that you can keep reading, keep exploring, and uh, continue your journey learning about birds and birding. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Charlotte. You've been wonderful speakers, and we've loved having you. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Eva, you're muted if if you if you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I didn't do that too much during the actual series. Uh, I just yeah. want to say thank you for all the people still on the call for providing all your wonderful comments. And thanks, Don. It's it's a pleasure. Uh, super fun. Great, great series. It, re really nice job putting this together. This is really fun. And for all our folks out there, so nice to see so many of you uh, come week after week. So I hope you have a great night and hopefully we'll see each other soon, at least in this virtual sphere. <laughs>